and again, can you hear me? Okay. And again, thank you to the Indigenous Roots Dancers. Hello, my name is Steven Taylor, and I'm one of the assistant principals here at Johnson High School. We wanted to welcome everyone. We, are Johnson, we at Johnson are so proud to be asked to host Mayor Carter here today. Thank you very much. You, you may have noticed that the building today has uh, the renovations that have taken place, much like Mayor Carter and his team are making changes that bringing new faces to City Hall. Today's State of Our City address is meant to break out of the norm and have do more doors open to those that may not have had the chance to participate before. Again, thank you for being here today, and now it's my honor to introduce Council President Amy Renmore. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. If you are able, please rise for the presentation of colors by the Johnson High School Air Force JROTC. Singing the national anthem will be performed by Janie and Mandy Chain. Stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. O'er oh, the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming.
Now you may be seated. <laughs> we got so excited there. So I'm going to give myself a redo. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Amy Brunmo, and the president of the St. Paul City Council, and I would like to welcome you all to the first annual State of Our City Summit. <laughs> It is wonderful to see such a group gathered on a really, really busy um, May morning. Although I have to say that the decision to reschedule this was wise, and <laughs> given the uh, snow-nami situation we had in the earlier date. Um, I'd also like to extend a special welcome to my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Bostrom, Councilmember Prince, Councilmember Tolbert, as well as County Commissioners Tony Carter, uh, Commissioner Jim McDonough, our Wonderful school board members John Broderick, Jeannie Foster, Zuki Ellis, Steve Marchese, John Schumacher. Uh, we also have Senator Fong Her with us today. And um, from across the river, uh, Mayor Jacob Fry. Welcome. Some of you veterans may have noticed that this event has changed a little bit from its usual format. In the past, the State of the City address was a time to hear from our mayor about his, and I'm being intentional about that word, priorities for the year. This year, we're building on the, that tradition, but with an added element of community engagement. City leadership wants to hear from you, and after hearing the State of the City address today, you will have the opportunity to connect and provide feedback and focus to our, for our shared vision of the City of St. Paul. So the goal is to have a two-way dialogue about our city. I'm excited and supportive about actively engaging in a two-way conversation about our city. Our community members, uh, from the oldest members to the new, have very different backgrounds, different life experiences, and different perspectives. A few years ago, Sakushi Zan, re Zan reached into my office. She was a Burmese refugee who had settled in the United States. She is a U.S. citizen now, raising her three kids in the North End, where thousands of Karen refugees and immigrants have established their homes. Sakushi so was attending college at the University of Minnesota and was looking for a meaningful internship that would help her community and her neighborhood. We hired her, of course. Sakushi so did great work connecting uh, home ownership and home improvement resources to the people in her community, but she also taught the Ward 5 team, Donna, Kim, and I, and actually the entire city council so much about her culture, and she helped us understand firsthand the challenges and joys the Karen community faces every day. Our relationship has helped her be a strong ambassador for the city and has helped the city better serve her community. This is what a two-way conversation looks like. I will note, last weekend, Sakushi graduated with honors from the U of M. She's pretty incredible. So on that high note, please help me in giving a warm welcome to my partner and friend and Mayor of St. Paul, Melvin Carter. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate you coming. Council President Bryn Moen, thank you very much, not only for your kind words and introduction, but for your incredible leadership. You have been an incredible leader for our city, and we greatly appreciate it. My name is Melvin Carter, and I am your mayor. <laughs> Welcome, and thank you for joining us at our first ever State of Our City Summit. We're trying something new today. I, before I speak, have to thank God, give honor to God for just giving me the ability to be right here. I want to give honor. You know they say that behind every strong man is an amazing woman. That's not true. 
We have a first lady who is always two steps in front of me. And I want to thank Dr. Sakina Futrell Carter for her leadership, her support, and her strength every single day of my life. Thank you so much. <laughs> to my family, you know my parents. Ramsey County Commissioner Tony Carter, retired St. Paul Police Sergeant Melvin Carter, thank you so much for your leadership and guidance and support through the years. To all of our friends, supporters, and community members, I really appreciate you being here today. To the members of our city council, those who are with us today, and those who were unable to join us on a Saturday morning, I thank you for your incredible service. I have learned much from you. I'm inspired by your passion, not only for the words you represent, but for your passion for the entire city and I'm honored to serve alongside you. To Mayor Fry, thank you so much for making the trip across the river this morning. <laughs> we'll be sure to pass, stamp your passport on the way back. Thank you so much for being here. I'm also honored, you know, we have a strong set of sister city relationships with cities across the globe. Just yesterday, Sakina and I got a chance to visit with our visiting mayor, Brewer, uh, from our sister city, Neuss, Germany, and his wife. Thank you so much for being here with us. I, we made the mistake of starting today with an incredible program. <laughs> After the incredible dancers from Indigenous Roots, Kaupuli, Yaose, Nashli, weren't they incredible? Yeah. After that incredible rendition of our national anthem from the Chachang. I feel like I'll ruin the morning by opening my mouth. <laughs> but I'll try anyways. I want to thank the members of our St. Paul School Board who are here and the members of our Johnson High School and St. Paul Public Schools family. Thank you for your service. Thank you for hosting us here today. The members of the County Commission who are here. Thank you for your leadership in our community. And I see several members of our St. Paul legislative delegation here as well. Thank you. We are partnering closely together to ensure that the city of St. Paul is well represented at the legislature right now. And I thank you for your leadership and your partnership. Please give them all a round of applause. I, I want to thank the volunteers, the planning committee members, and the staff who've worked together to make today possible. If you're part of that group, would you just wave your hand so we can recognize who you are? Oh, they're all out back working. Give them a round of applause if they can hear, would you please? And I just want to thank all of you for coming out here today. There they are waving in the back. And I want to thank all of you for coming out today. We are trying something new in St. Paul. We are on the cutting edge of something exciting in St. Paul. For 138 days now, I've had the privilege and humbling honor and the extreme challenge of serving as mayor of the most incredible city on the planet, St. Paul, Minnesota. Sorry, Mayor Fry and Mayor Drewer. <laughs> I stand before you today to report on the state of our city in three words. St. Paul is strong. St. Paul is dynamic. And most importantly, St. Paul is ours. The state of our city is strong. We are a growing, vibrant city with wind in our sails and big opportunities ahead. The former Ford plant in Highland and the former Hillcrest golf course right here on the east side give us not one, but two iconic opportunities 
to design a 100 plus acre 21st century neighborhood from the ground up. Big development opportunities like Midway Shopping Center, Keg and Case on West 7th, and the Union Depot promise to significantly expand our tax base and create vibrant new destinations across the city. Areas like Little Mekong, Little Africa, District Del Sol, Selby Avenue, Payne Phelan, and the North Side, nor the North End, are redefining our city and leveraging our cultural diversity to create exciting job and business opportunities. The Green Line on University Avenue, the promise of bus rapid transit on the Gold Line, and a streetcar connection from downtown to the airport promise to better connect our residents and businesses to opportunity throughout the region. The opening of Osborne 370 as a professional maker space for innovators from around the world and the opening of Treasure Island Center, complete with a top floor practice facility for the Minnesota Wild, are continuing to prove our momentum downtown and our new downtown alliance, which I lead in close partnership with Securian CEO Chris Hilger, Ecolab CEO Doug Baker, and a number of downtown residents and business leaders will help ensure that our downtown remains a vital core of commerce and culture that connects to and offers opportunity for our entire city. And our recent announcement that Techstars is planting their new farm to fork accelerator here, bringing tech innovators and startup leaders from around the globe to grow their businesses in St. Paul proves the rest of the world is taking notice of our progress. Meanwhile, the St. Saint Paul Saints are preparing for their home opener. Our Minnesota Wild made the playoffs for their sixth straight year. Minnesota United will bring Major League Soccer starting next spring, and the Gold Cup International Soccer Tournament will bring the U.S. Men's National Soccer Team and the eyes of the world to St. Saint Paul next summer. I'm proud of this city. I'm excited by this city. And I'm humbled by the opportunity to serve as your mayor. And I'm incredibly proud of all the amazing work we are doing together. At my inauguration in January, I told you that the three pillars of our work together are public safety, lifelong learning, and economic justice and inclusion. Our public safety strategy rejects the us versus them approach that has failed our communities for far too long and replaces it with our community first public safety plan, connecting children and families to opportunity, creating a safe, nurturing community for people returning from incarceration and investing in the critical trust that flows between our officers and our neighbors. From day one, we worked closely with our police chief, Todd Axtell, and his leadership team, as well as many of you, to review and rewrite the policies that govern when and how our officers are authorized to use force. I appreciate our chief's urgent attention and willingness to revise our policies through a public conversation. I've never seen any examples anywhere in the world where a police department engaged residents in an ongoing two-month, two-way conversation about what our use of force policy should look like. We worked together to ensure that our new policy reflected both the experiences of our officers and the street level expertise of our local community members. If you participated in that process in any way, would you wave a hand and be recognized? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our zero to three initiative leverages our rec centers, our libraries, and even our water department to connect families with young children to the support resources our community has to offer. And we are working hard to realize our vision of starting every child born in St. Paul on the path to college with $50 in a college savings account. On occasion, on occasion, people look at me and say, $50 isn't enough to pay for college. <laughs> I 
I say, really? <laughs> Research shows us that children from low-income families who have even a small amount of money saved for college are three times more likely to go. I deeply appreciate the way our local businesses, banks, colleges, foundations, and nonprofit leaders have stepped forward to help with this exciting and transformational concept. Specifically, I'm excited about the incredible group of individuals who have stepped forward to serve on our College Savings Accounts Task Force, led by, led by co-chairs Ann Mulholland, Vice President of Community Impact at Minnesota Community Foundation, and Nicole Beckstrand, President of Sunrise Banks, to develop over the next year a set of recommendations about how to design, implement, and fund St. Paul's College Savings Accounts Plan. Would any members of that CSA task force who are in the room wave your hand to be recognized? And you know that in a city that works for all of us, no one who works full time should ever be stuck raising children in poverty. I have been clear. I have been clear on minimum wage, and so have you. In our largest municipal election in over a decade, over 95% of St. Paul voters cast their ballot for a candidate who supported raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. We've talked about this. We've talked about this long enough. It's time for action. I am committed to working with our city council to pass and sign an ordinance establishing a $15 minimum wage into law by the end of this year. <clears throat> we have work to do. We have work to do to get there. In the coming months, we will work with our city council, labor and business leaders, and all of you to fill in the specifics of our policy, including whether to make accommodations for small businesses and youth job training programs, how to best phase in the increase, and whether to allow employers to pay tipped workers a lower wage. I have strong feelings about these questions, and I know many of you do too. We won't always agree, and that's a good thing. It means we can learn from each other. One thing we can agree on, though, is that our businesses and our workers are inseparable parts of one whole. For our families and workers to thrive, we need our businesses to succeed. For our businesses to thrive, we need our families and workers to succeed. This is an opportunity to, for us to practice a skill that is far too rare in today's political discourse. We will listen to each other. We will learn from each other's perspective. We will develop a course of action together, and we will move forward together. I appreciate the Citizens League stepping forward to convene a minimum wage study committee for us to explore and bring recommendations about how to best craft a policy that works well for St. Paul. Would the members of our minimum wage study committee please wave a hand and be recognized? Thank you. A safer city, a city that invests in the future of its children, and a city that is committed to paying fair wages for hard work. That's what's happening right here, right now. That's why St. Paul is a strong city. St. Paul is also a dynamic city. We are a rapidly growing, rapidly changing community. If my great grandparents were here today, they would hardly recognize us as the small, quaint Irish Catholic town where the cathedral stood as the highest building in town. This is not our great grandparents' St. Paul anymore. We are a diverse, thriving, international, multilingual community. Our residents and business owners come from all over the globe, speak over 100 different languages at home, and practice countless different religions, cultures, and customs. We're a growing city. Our population has grown by over 24,000 people in the last eight years alone. 
We're nearing an all-time high population and projected to just keep on growing over the next generation. Growth and change requires a dynamic city building strategy to retool all of our neighborhoods for the future. We'll need more classrooms, more after school programs, more library books to connect our children and families to opportunity and a bright future. We'll need more paramedics, firefighters, and police officers than ever before to keep our neighborhoods safe. We'll need more living wage career ladder jobs that give our neighbors a chance to get ahead. We'll need to invest to ensure people can get around our city by transit, bicycle, and on foot. And every goal we have as a city will rely on us building thousands more units of housing that is affordable and accessible to all of us, especially our lowest income residents. <laughs> Sustaining these public investments will require investment. So growing our tax base is more urgent than ever. That's why we have to meet our biggest opportunities with a big vision. We just can't afford to sell ourselves short. We also have to be willing to have tough conversations and tackle our biggest challenges head on. Let me tell you, I've learned a lot about big challenges over these past few months. We've had more snow emergencies in these past months <laughs> than in the past two years combined. Right now, Wabasha Avenue is closed with 30,000 pounds of rock that dropped onto it from the bluff above. And just this week, we made the tough decision to temporarily close the River Center ramp, our largest downtown parking ramp, after a piece of concrete ceiling, approximately two feet by three feet in size, detached from the ceiling and damaged a parked car below. We are facing all of these challenges. Our snow crew battled each snowfall heroically and are now working feverishly to repair our streets. Our staff is managing the cleanup and working to stabilize the bluffs above Wabasha Avenue, and we have a strong proposal in front of our state legislature right now to partner with us to rebuild our River Center ramp, which serves over 2.1 million visitors and helps produce over $12 million in sales tax revenue each year. I appreciate the deep coalition of labor and business leaders, the strong support of our entire city council and almost every member of the St. Paul legislative delegation, as well as the bipartisan support this important project has received at the Capitol. We wrote an op-ed last week and we put it in the paper from our labor leaders, from our business leaders, from our Chamber of Commerce presidents, and from me and from the president of our chamber of, of our St. Paul City Council. And one person read that letter and said, you know, the fact that all of these people signed one piece of paper is news in and of itself. <laughs> We've learned tough and painful lessons about the importance of investing to keep our infrastructure safe and reliable. Rebuilding the River Center ramp is a chance for us to get it right. Finally, we're also preparing for one of the toughest logistical challenges a city can make as we shift our city this fall to an organized hauling system. We've talked about for a long time, we've talked about how important that is to reduce wear and tear on our streets, to ensure a safer, cleaner city, and to reduce our carbon footprint. Please visit stpaul.gov garbage to stay up to date on the latest information and updates about how we're preparing for this major change which will impact every single household across our city. I know that big change makes us uncomfortable and challenges our city in many ways. I also know that seeing change on the horizon, recognizing that change is inevitable, and starting now to retool our community for the changes ahead is the key to transforming challenge into opportunity for the future. And that brings me to my favorite part. 
Finally, most importantly, the state of our city is ours. See, back in high school, I once made the mistake of asking my dad if I could borrow the car. <laughs> dad told me, there's no such thing as the car. You're asking to borrow my car. <laughs> so the most incredible, most exciting thing about this city is that it's our city. It's in our hands. St. Paul isn't the city. St. Paul isn't my city or any mayor's city. This is our city. <laughs> Crafting solutions to our challenges, preparing our children for the future, and keeping our neighbors safe will require all of us to build the vision and do the work together. That's why we invited you in right from the beginning. We needed your help to hire staff, for an administration that reflects St. Paul's diversity and leverages community expertise. And over 100 of you spent three days reading resumes, reading resumes, interviewing candidates, and sending me recommendations. Because of your help, we hired a talented and diverse team who has hit the ground running. If you served on one of our hiring panels, would you wave your hand and be recognized? And if you serve, as a member of my administration, my office, or as a city employee, would you please stand now and be recognized for your incredible work? We needed your help, like I said before, to rewrite those policies that govern when and how officers are authorized to use force. And hundreds of you brought your ideas and concerns forward in an unprecedented public conversation. I've heard from many of you who are excited about this invitation for a renewed relationship with your city. And I also hear from those of you who have concerns. One person told me right from the beginning, I think the problem is we're just not used to seeing it done this way. But doing things differently isn't our problem at all. It's our promise. <laughs> Building a city that works for all of us will require more than new laws and programs. It will require us to completely rethink the way we run our city. Building a city that works for all of us requires a dynamic approach to city building, an approach that feels new but actually traces its roots all the way back to the opening paragraphs of our country's Declaration of Independence. See, right after life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, our founding leaders made an even more transformative, even more revolutionary declaration, one whose implications we far too rarely explore. Governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. Historians interpret that, staying, that statement to mean that your mayor, your governor, and yes, even your president, our legitimate and moral right to power stems only from the consent of the people who fall under that power. Whether our topic is minimum wage, police reform, bike lanes, density, or just what celebrations we can have in our local schools, we are constantly struggling with the concept of consent. Even our national conversations like gun violence prevention and immigration, all of these tough choices center around the questions whose voices count, whose opinions matter. These are important questions with a very simple answer. Governments derive their just power from the consent of the governed. That promise calls us to go beyond the loudest voices, beyond the people already in the room, beyond our own privilege to listen and learn from all of our neighbors, all of our families, all of our children. So when we ask, do immigrants and refugees have a place, have a say in our communities, I ask, are they the governed? 
when we ask our student leaders who are tired of gun violence and school shootings, they're too young to vote, but do they deserve a say? Are they governed? Our neighbors who have returned to our community from incarceration, do they deserve a vote? Are they governed? We are all the governed. All of our voices matter. You know, I'm St. Paul's first mayor of color. And we in St. Paul have some of the worst disparities in the nation. I know you know those two things already. What amazes me is how often we disconnect the two. Our disparities aren't coincidental to the fact that no person of color has ever before held this job. They're the direct result of the exclusive processes through which we too often make decisions. See, that's why today has to be a summit, not just a speech. And I hope you're staying for the summit portion of the morning. Our engagement together is the only way we can truly lead this city forward in a way that best serves all of our communities and families and prepares all of our children for success. We have to reimagine St. Paul and truly make it our city together. I know that many of you know that, and I'm inspired by your energy. Sakina and I can't walk through the grocery store without someone stopping us to ask how they can help. I've heard you loud and clear. You have more to offer. You don't want, just want me to do good things in City Hall. You're ready to roll up your sleeves and jump in. Our biggest challenge is harnessing the incredible people power alive in this city. From our mayor's office staff and city employees to residents in every neighborhood, ordinary people, are working together every day to do extraordinary things. You are what's most beautiful about St. Paul. A year ago, I met an incredible couple named Wade and Julia Burgess. They told me all about their beautiful daughter, Vivian, her infectious, joyful smile, her love for the playground near their house, and how on November 12th, 2016, they found Vivi unresponsive in bed, just hours after celebrating her third birthday. I can't imagine the trauma they experienced, nor the strength it must have taken to challenge, to channel their pain into Vivian's joy, the foundation they established to bring awareness to sudden unexplained death in childhood and to share Vivian's joy with other children by raising money to transform Vivi's playground at Boyd Park into a destination play space that encourages active, outdoor, and imaginative play. Wade and Julia are here with us today. Thank you for your work to keep Vivian's joy alive in St. Paul. Thank you. St. Paul officers, Annie Baumgart and Fong Chung are here today too. A school resource officer and a member of our Police Athletic League, they work to keep our city safe by building meaningful connections with the students they serve. Earlier this school year, they worked together to start an empowerment and leadership group for seventh grade girls at Washington Technology Magnet. The girls they serve talk to each other, they go on fun field trips, they learn valuable skills, and they volunteer together. Officers Baumgart and Chung represent the St. Paul Police Department well. They're providing an invaluable experience to girls at a critical age, providing a new image of who a police officer is, and encouraging students to give back. They're here today too. Please join me in honoring their service as well. As excited as I am about the St. Paul of today, our youth and student leaders make me even more hopeful about our future. 
That's why this summit today is a tribute to student leadership. Did you notice that? From our youth hosts from St. Paul Youth Services outside, to the Chichangs who graced us with that amazing national anthem, to the Johnson High School JROTC Honor Guard, to DJ Mickey Breeze, who will keep us moving to the beat during our summit later this morning. We got out the car and Sakina said, there's a DJ? And I said, it's a state of our city summit, isn't it? Today is a tribute to student leadership because our students are leading. After the shooting that left 17 students dead at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School this spring, students all over the country stepped forward with a simple message, enough. I've heard that message from third graders who wanted to know why their tallest classmates have to worry about covering the windows in an active shooter situation and from their teacher who suffers nightmares about whether or not to unlock the classroom door to rescue a student she allowed to use the restroom. Enough. I heard that message from the students who testified powerfully at our state capitol when Representative Dave Pinto formed, forced a hearing on mandatory background checks and gun violence restraining orders. Enough. And I heard it loud and clear from the hundreds of students who walked out at Harding High School on March 14th with signs that read, Books, not bullets. I spent an hour with that student leadership team who organized that walkout. Like all of us, they have had enough of the mass shootings that have plagued our country again and again. And they asked me what I think is powerful enough to make this time different. A few of those Harding students are here today too, and I have an answer for you. You are that difference. You know, I could go on and on. Every day, I see ordinary people all over this city working together to do extraordinary things, even on one of my toughest nights yet as mayor, when blizzard conditions left some of our students stuck at school past 10 p.m. I saw teachers and parents, EAs and TAs, plow drivers, bus drivers, and just neighbors with shovels pitching in together cheerfully to get our students home safe. Like the city of St. Paul, that night was beautiful because it was challenging. I can see our vision for our city every day in the artwork that hangs on the wall outside my office. See, for three months last year, residents from all, of all ages and backgrounds who live in different corners of this city, practice different cultures and religions, and speak different languages at home, took broken pieces of tile and glued them together into a vivid mosaic that reads, a St. Paul for all of us. That's our vision, that's our challenge. All of us working together to build a city that works for all of us. My highest hope is to harness our people power and weave it into our dynamic city building strategy, not just once, not just this year, not just while I'm mayor, but just to weave it into the way we govern, lead, and budget, into the way we program our rec centers and libraries, into the way we build our local economy and prepare our children for the future. At my inauguration, I said to you, don't clap if you're not going to help. And more of you clapped after I said that. So today we're launching Serve St. Paul to invite you to build sweat equity in our city through service. We need your help building the vision, advancing our vision through policy and funding proposals, serving on task forces, commissions, district councils, and nonprofit boards, and as volunteers in our schools, libraries, and rec centers. Building a city that works for all of us will require all of us to do the work. Sign up at stpaul.gov serve. I'm closing. St. Paul is a strong city with every competitive advantage to emerge and thrive in the future. St. Paul is a dynamic city, changing and growing in exciting ways. And St. Paul is our city to govern together and to equip for the dynamic future ahead. Now is a critical time in our city, our state, our country, and our world. You know the voices that urge us to hate and fear each other seem louder than ever. We turn on the news each day to more and more dire news of another shooting, another scandal, another heartbreaking tweet or quote 
from a president who still hasn't learned that our people, all of our people, is what's great about America. You know, sometimes the challenge ahead seems too great to bear, but two weeks ago, I got a chance to spend time with Kofi Annan, a McAllister College alumnus who went on to serve as Secretary General of the United Nations and win the Nobel Peace Prize in 2001. To paraphrase, I heard him tell a group of students, you can change the world by changing your school, your community, your city. That powerful, empowering message is the way forward. 157 years ago, almost to the day, facing the most volatile, divisive, and deadly chapter in our country's history, President Abraham Lincoln sent out a call for volunteers to save our country. Within weeks, over 1,000 Minnesotans answered that call, including a small company called the St. Paul Volunteers. That first Minnesota regiment was one of the first to answer President Lincoln's call, and they went on to serve valiantly in some of the Civil War's most critical battles. If a small group of St. Paul volunteers 157 years ago could lead and save our union, imagine what we can do together today. We can eliminate disparities and build a city that works for all of us. We can set our children on the path to college and a bright future. We can and we will because we won't stop pushing until we do. Thank you very much. Thank you.